Hey, lead editor Dan, I'm uh, trying to find that one meme of Leonardo DiCaprio for today's food theory episode. Sure. Oh, I was thinking the um the the one where he's holding a drink. This one? The other one. This one? The other other one, I guess. This one? Wow, there is a surprising number. This one? No. This one? No. This one? There it is. Great. What version? This one? internet welcome to food theory the show whose new year's resolution is to stop overthinking everything and start over overthinking everything theorists it's time for a new year and even if the previous one has left me feeling like the revenant leo it always feels good to strike out into the new one feeling like gatsby leo and for many ringing in the new year means one thing making out with strangers at the stroke of midnight but with health concerns at an all-time high i think everyone's instead gonna be ringing in 2021 by choosing option two a champagne toast. Whether it's New Year's, graduation, your wedding, or just your Tuesday night, champagne is the de facto drink for celebration. Unless, of course, you're me and then it's a crisp Diet Coke. But here's the thing, friends. As you prepare to chink your glasses at 12 o'clock, be aware you're doing it wrong. No, really. Hate to burst your bubbly here, but there is a high likelihood that you are drinking your champagne wrong. And don't feel bad. It's not like it's your fault. Humanity's been botching the way they appreciate this drink since the era of Louis the 16th. So, what are we getting wrong, and how how do we correct for it? Well, bottoms up, theorists. By the time you get to the bottom of this tall, cool glass of knowledge, you're gonna start feeling a bit woozy. So hand those keys over to a designated subscriber before things really get out of hand. Our story begins with Marie Antoinette's left breast. Say what? You heard that right, friends. I'm not out here risking demonetization just for kicks. It's long been legend that Louis XVI had a glass designed in the shape of said body part as a gift. Weird gift, but okay, you do you, Louis. That glass became known as the coupe glass and became the primary vessel of drinking champagne at the time. Now, keep in mind that this legend's actually been told the same way with the boobs of a couple of Louis XV's mistresses, Napoleon's wife, and a whole bunch of other women. You get the idea. Lots of people want to claim the coupe in the name of their girlfriend's chesticles. In actuality, the origins of the coupe class can be traced back to England in 1663, when it was invented as a vessel for sparkling wine. Keep in mind, all champagne is sparkling wine, but not all sparkling wine is technically champagne. In order to be considered champagne, the sparkling wine has to come from the Champagne region of northern France. It didn't take long for the coupe class to catch on with the French royalty. So, I mean, if it's good enough for kings, it should be good enough for us to drink champagne out of, right? Well, that depends on how much you appreciate appreciate bubbles. <laughs> the bubbles in your champagne, and all sparkling wine for that matter, are incredibly delicate. So maintaining those bubbles long enough for you to actually enjoy them is going to be difficult, but also essential in order to have the proper imbibing experience. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a quick overview of how sparkling wine is made. The grapes are picked, pressed, and filtered so that the skin, stems, and seeds are removed. Then the grape juice is mixed with yeast and stored in vats so that the sugars are converted into ethanol, aka a alcohol and carbon dioxide. At this point, champagne is just normal wine because the CO2 has had a chance to escape out into the air. The base wine is then blended with other wines made of grapes from different vineyards to create the perfect balance of sugar, acidity, and flavor. Now comes the step that actually makes it sparkling wine, the second fermentation process. The nice blended wine is mixed with yeast and sugar, distributed into bottles, and corked. The yeast and sugar react to create CO2 or carbon dioxide bubbles. But this time, the CO2 can't escape. It's trapped in an airtight corked bottle. So with nowhere to go, it instead dissolves into the wine. The concentration of dissolved CO2 creates pressure, but as long as the bottle's closed, you don't see any of the bubbles. That's because the gas in the wine and the gas in the space under the cork is in equilibrium. When you remove the cork, a bunch of oxygen rushes in and throws off the balance of pressure. So to try and get that balance back, the champagne releases its CO2 through bubble formation and diffusion, which is just a fancy way of saying that that the CO2 molecules are going to move from the liquid into the surrounding air. Now, think about this. The more air that the champagne's exposed to, the more CO2 it has to release in order to maintain equilibrium with the atmosphere. So the more air you expose champagne to, the faster it's going to release all those bubbles and go flat, otherwise known as degassing. Which, can we just start a petition right now to change the word fart into degass? Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry, my body had to de-gas itself. Anyway, a coupe's bowl is shallow and wide, so the wine has a large surface area. That was great for Louis the 16th and his subjects who slammed glasses of champagne like frat boys crush beers, but not so great if you're actually trying to enjoy the wine. Without any place for bubbles to form and a lot of room to breathe, most of the CO2 in a coupe glass is going to be released through diffusion. Since it's shallow and wide, the wine can just release big clouds of CO2, and just like that, it's totally flat. Our taste buds perceive carbonation as sour, so flat champagne just ends up tasting dull and overly sweet. So about a half century after the coupe glass was invented, the champagne flute hits the scene. Unlike the coupe glass, the flute was designed to help sustain the effervescence of sparkling wine via its long, skinny column. Basically, the inverse shape of a coupe glass. See, the opening of the flute exposes only a small portion of the champagne's surface area to air, so there's less space to release CO2 through diffusion. That means that the champagne has limited opportunity to degas through its surface and instead has to rely on bubble formation. It's pretty clever, right? Who knew that so much science actually went into these glasses? But it doesn't stop there. If you've ever had a nice wine flute, it's actually holding another secret way down at the bottom of the glass. In order for bubbles to form in a glass, there have to be pre-existing gas cavities in the glass before the wine is poured. These are naturally formed by fibers that stick to the inside of the wall, like tiny pockets that are already there before you pour. Once the wine is poured, the carbon dioxide fills the space inside these fibers. The carbon dioxide concentrates until it becomes large enough to become buoyant and detach from the cavity in the shape of a bubble. Flute makers often etch tiny extra cracks or scratches into the bottom of the bowl to artificially create more uniform gas cavities so that the bubbles peter off in a column through the center of the glass. So am I saying that you're drinking your champagne wrong if you use a coupe? Is the flute the perfect glass to enjoy champagne? Well, it turns out that there are two sides to every coin and we shouldn't start toasting our victory just yet. Here's one thing that the flute gets wrong. Champagne is best when the bubbles are fine, but that long distance trip up the glass means that all the bubbles will be a lot more substantial than they would be in a coupe glass. So that's a point for Team Coupe. On top of that, we can't just focus on one bubble at a time in an entire champagne glass. One glass of champagne can release 11 million bubbles, and it turns out that these bubbles actually serve a purpose. The bubbles chase after each other and form what are called bubble trains. These trains aren't just for show, they actually swirl the wine and mix it for you in your glass. This swirling action mixes the champagne and creates distinctive aromas in what's known as the champagne's vortex zone. This so-called vortex zone, in addition to sounding like a radical place to hold a laser tag party in middle school is actually extremely important for the experience of drinking champagne. Combined, the bubble trains and the fizz make sparkling wine very aromatic. And any good wine taster worth their Syrah can tell you that smell is one of the most important aspects of the wine tasting experience. That lovely bouquet kind of goes to waste in a flute. The slim opening prevents your nose from getting a good whiff of the wine. Especially egregious when you consider that 75 to 95 percent of all taste can be attributed to your nose. But the coupe, with its wide wider vortex zone ensures that you'll be able to get a good whiff as you sip. So then is the coupe the right glass to drink champagne from? Well, the coupe is so wide that the whole glass doesn't get mixed, and there are dead zones of wine that don't get swirled. And that's not all. The coupe's design makes it ridiculously unstable. A heavy, wide-brimmed bowl balancing on top of a spindly piece of glass is attractive, but not all that practical. When the coupe is full, you pretty much have to hold it from the bowl to prevent it spilling, which means that your body heat is gonna warm the champagne really quickly, throwing off both its flavor and aroma. The flute, on the other hand, never really requires being held by the bowl, preventing your body heat from getting anywhere near the majority of the wine. So where does that leave us? Are a few extra bubbles in a flute worth missing a huge percentage of the actual taste and smell of champagne? Or is the coupe the right way to go, forcing you to drink it faster so the champagne doesn't heat up or degas or suffer from all the dead zones? Really, it seems like a lose-lose situation here. Neither glass seems like like the right fit for drinking champagne. So if the flute is too skinny and tall, and the coupe is too short and squat, what are we supposed to drink champagne out of? Who wins the Champagne Olympics? Both glasses have been around since at least the 1700s, and even now, centuries later, we haven't managed to pin down a hands-down winner. Does that mean, then, that champagne glasses are just a fluctuating fad, and society drinks out of whatever it deems cool at the time? I can't bring myself to believe that. This is a finely crafted wine glass we're talking 
talking about, not some fad like poodle skirts or pogs. Totally guilty of pogs, by the way. What I'm saying is that there has to be a glass that's objectively better than the others at delivering champagne into our mouths. As you might imagine, this is a hotly, hotly debated topic among people in the industry. There's no shortage of valid opinions on both sides of the argument, but based upon the science that we've covered today, the winner has to be the tulip glass. That's right, folks. A new player has entered the game, and it's the solution to all of our bubble trouble. See, the tulip glass is basically a compromise between the coupe, the flute, and the traditional white wine glass, and it's gaining popularity with a lot of wine experts. For one thing, it forces the alcohol aroma to the outside of the glass to hide behind the slim, but not too slim rings so that you're only smelling the sweet stuff from the center of the bowl. The moderately sized bowl and long stem prevent the champagne from overheating. The champagne is exposed to let air in, but not quite as much as the coupe, so the CO2 won't diffuse as quickly. And finally, on the practical side, it's taller and is only meant to be filled up halfway, so it won't slosh off the sides with every step you take, even when you're on glass six. And don't get to glass six. Gatsby isn't toasting to irresponsible drinking choices. Now, certainly not every sommelier and wine expert out there is prepared to leave behind over three centuries of coupe and flute history behind, but nonetheless, some are pushing the envelope, striving every day to achieve the perfect glass, and many of those glasses borrow coupe and flute attributes alike. So there you have it, theorists, and even if you don't have a tulip glass at your disposal this New Year's, some wine experts believe that you'll actually have a better experience drinking your champagne from a traditional white wine glass, which resembles the tulip glass in many ways, than you will from a festive flute. But perhaps the sweetest drink of all is knowing that we made it through 2020. So eat, drink, and be merry this New Year, and hey, why not do it with the help of our sponsor for today's episode, HelloFresh. See, one of my resolutions for 2021 is to eat better. Another is to spend more time with my family. Thanks to HelloFresh, I'm getting it done on both fronts. What HelloFresh does is they send recipes and meal kits straight to your door every week. Steph and I have found it to be a really great way to get out of our recipe rut. Week in and week out, HelloFresh is providing us with all sorts of new five-star recipes we never would have thought to try otherwise. But for us, probably the best thing about HelloFresh is the time it saves. Between running the Food Theory channel, the other theory channels being a parent, it's not easy to eat well, or make it to the grocery store, or prep food. Fortunately, HelloFresh takes all the stress out of meal planning and saves us so much time on meal prep. I'm telling you, we're able to get these healthy, full-blown meals on the table in 30, sometimes even 20 minutes. The portions are huge and they are all delicious. And HelloFresh is really flexible with their weekly deliveries too. They're happy to accommodate any time we want to change our food preferences or delivery date, or order some extra garlic bread. Seriously, the garlic bread is amazing. And not just normal garlic bread amazing either, I'm talking cheat on your New Year's resolution kind of amazing. No joke, for lunch, before recording this, I had a HelloFresh meal with the garlic bread. Between Steph and I, we had the entire loaf. Like, we were planning on saving some of it for later, but nope, just disappeared. And I gotta say, outside of all these other benefits, as a couple of YouTubers who put our all into charity efforts, we love that HelloFresh is as committed to giving back as we are. They donated over two and a half million dollars to charity in 2019, and this year they've stepped up their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis. So here's the deal. You ready for this one? We always have special deals at the end of these things, but this one is really special. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code FOODTHEORY10 to get yourself 10 free meals, including free shipping. You heard that right, theorists. 10 free meals with free shipping to boot. So you're just getting free food sent straight to your door. So when you head over to HelloFresh.com, don't forget to let them know that Food Theory sent you with the promo code FOODTHEORY10. Get 10 free meals on me. Tell me what you think of them. I really love HelloFresh. If you're busy and you find yourself eating fast food all the time and you want to eat better with good varied meals, man, this is a great solution. And honestly, for the cost, you're just throwing that away at fast food anyway. So why not eat better and healthier for almost the same price? It's totally worth it. Anyway, check out HelloFresh. Link is down in the description below or like I said, HelloFresh.com, Food Theory 10. And remember, that's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit.